Hey everyone, Dave here, and right now I'm geeking out over the Muppet Christmas Carol. Dave's obsession, Dave's obsession of the moment. Every year on Christmas Eve, my family watches the Muppet Christmas Carol. I'm guessing most of you have a similar tradition, or at least you've seen it a handful of times, so this isn't one of those obsession videos where I have to explain what some obscure thing I love is. This isn't Gemini Man. By the way, way to steal that title and literally nothing else about the show, Ang Lee. No, I'm assuming everyone here has a baseline shared love of Muppet Christmas Carol, so I'm just gonna talk about some of the reasons I love the movie. And maybe some of the things I don't love quite as much about it. Look, you see a movie every year, you memorize it, you start to have some nitpicks. Not things that ruin the movie for you, of course, just things that give you an unintentional chuckle amidst the intentional chuckles. But don't worry, this video will mostly be a gush fest, just with a little dash of salt here and there. But first we need to talk about how important this movie is in Muppet history. Yes, it did begin the trend of Muppets adapting classic literature, for better and for worse. But it's more than just that. As the first feature-length Muppet movie made after Jim Henson's death, there was a lot riding on this. So creative control went to Jim's son, the newly appointed Henson Company CEO, and my co-worker on a technicality, don't you dare take this away from me, Brian Henson, making his feature film directorial debut. This was actually the the first Muppet movie shot Christmas after Christmas. after my father, Jim Henson, had passed away. It, because of that, the film is sort of very important to a lot of us because this was really a test to see if if the Muppets could continue. And I and and everybody really um, stepped up, and all the performances are brilliant. The workshop did brilliant work. And he stacked a creative deck with Muppets behind the scenes all stars, bringing in longtime Muppets head writer Jerry Jewell to write the script and frequent Muppet collaborator Paul Williams to write the songs, most of which are fantastic. Some of which maybe could use a punch-up. Oh, there goes Mr. Humbug, there goes Mr. Grimm. If they gave a prize for being mean, the winner would be him. Come on, Paul, you co-wrote Moving Right Along. I know you don't need to force a rhyme that hard. But Jerry's script is fantastic throughout. It's a fairly abridged, but still surprisingly faithful adaptation of the Dickens text. There are stretches where Jerry takes the book verbatim and then just has Gonzo and Rizzo riff on it. Really, the only difference between uh, this and the original is that the original was a book and this is a movie. And uh, we have uh, lots of frogs and pigs and chickens and rats playing the main parts. How close to the original is, is your script? Well, um, our script is so close to the original that kids will be able to come and see the movie and be able to do a book report later. <laughs> that ought to bring him in. And the desire to create an authentic Dickens adaptation at the core carried through into the production. Lots of franchises and TV shows do their Christmas Carol episode, but most of them have their characters fill all the roles. This one could have done that. A Christmas Carol cast entirely with Muppets would have been easily doable. You could have had Waldorf as Scrooge and Statler as Marley, and then not needed to create a second Marley just for the movie. But then, of course, we'd miss out on the perfect pop culture gag that is the second Marley's name. Jacob and Robert Marley! Get up, stand up! And early in development, this film did come very close to having even more of the book's roles filled by familiar Muppets. Initially, the ghosts were going to be Muppets, and it, Muppets, well-known Muppets, and it seemed like a great idea, and then in the end we didn't do it because it seemed to undermine the credibility of the story. Miss Piggy, I think, was Ghost of Christmas Present, and then, like, Scooter was Christmas Past, and then Gonzo in a Hood was going to be Christmas Yet to Come. But instead of going all out in a Muppet Classics Theater version of the book, they opted to do a more grounded Christmas Carol adaptation, with Muppets just sprinkled throughout like a garnish. Now, this may have started the unfortunate trend of Muppets being sidelined in their own projects. I mean, when people go to a Muppet movie, they say, Gee, I can't wait to see the human! But honestly, here I think it was the right choice. The thrill of the original Muppet movie was seeing the Muppets in a real-world environment, bringing their whimsy out of a puppet show stage and onto the road. And this is more obviously sound stages, but there's still a groundedness to the Dickensian backdrops that allows the Muppets to provide a delightful contrast. And grounding it all is Michael Caine, and I don't need to tell you how fantastic he is in this role. Michael Caine was, um... Uh, probably, it was a while ago now, but I think he was probably our first choice for the part. What's wonderful about Michael, and he got it straight away, as soon as he did the very first read-through, 
He said to me afterwards, he, he said, well, the trick here is to never treat them as Muppets and treat it like I'm acting with the Royal Shakespeare Company and never, ever crack a smile and always be very straight, and that's what will create the, the comic dynamic between the Muppets and himself. And he was absolutely right. He said, well, look, you should never work with children and animals, they say, for actors, and Muppets are even worse, they're scene stealers. <laughs> And the only thing that you have that can save you with the Muppets is reality, because that's what they do not have. It's the only thing they don't have. They have everything else in space. The world building of this movie all hinges on Kane's performance, and his chemistry with the Muppets makes you genuinely believe that talking to ghosts is weird for him, yet talking to a frog and rats on a daily basis is normal. This is less true of the teenage Scrooge, who is totally tripping out on the giant bird talking to him. But most of the other humans populating this world are also wonderful, and they never once take you out of the reality. Except as you're scratching your head trying to figure out who they remind you of. I know Nephew Fred is neither Neil Patrick Harris nor Robert Sean Leonard, so how is he somehow both of them at once? Why is young Michael Caine an off-brand Jude Law? Did this movie predict the 2004 reboot of Alfie? Oh, it's not just you, I also forgot that movie happened until five minutes ago. But we mustn't forget the hard work of the Muppet performers. As always, every last one of them is spectacular. And while it's hard to not feel the loss of both Jim Henson and Richard Hunt, the rest of the regular ensemble brings their all to the table and are just as energetic as the day they first picked up a puppet. Special shout out to Steve Whitmire, because not only was this his first feature film outing as Kermit, but it also had greatly expanded roles for Rizzo and Bean, who previously hadn't had all that much screen time in movies before, and man, he just delivers. It's great work all around. Now, like I said, my family watches this every Christmas Eve. Growing up, we watched it on VHS, which meant it wasn't officially Christmas until we saw that Lion King teaser where Katzenberg says Big Kitty. Some of their subjects were even invited right into the studio. Big Kitty. <laughs> but as much as I love the movie, like any kid, I got really bored when it got to the slow, sad song. I love you, Bill. You did once. There was a time when I was sure that you and I were truly one. Come on, this song doesn't have any Muppets in it. Fast forward. What is this, a Legoland Fire safety show? Why is this song so long? Good lord, just get back to Gonzo already. Yeah, yeah, Michael Caine's sad, it's very emotional, but this song just won't end! No, oh, oh, don't worry, Rizzo, it's okay, the boring part's over now. Of course, now every year, we watch the 2002 DVD release, which means it's not officially Christmas until we hear Tim Allen tell a kid from the movie surfers what it's like to remake the Shaggy Dog. I'm a dog, man. I'm Shaggy Dog. What would you say is the hardest part about being a dog? Dogs are constantly distracted by odors. And because we're red-blooded Americans, we watch the theatrical widescreen cut because we all know Pan and Scan is a satanic plot to undermine artists' visions, and when it gets to the when love is gone scene... I love you, Bill. You did once. <laughs> huh. That's... Abrupt. Like, yeah, I get that Scrooge would be this emotional to relive his heartbreak, but I don't buy for one second that such a brief, okay, we're done, would devastate Rizzo this much when he already copped to not understanding loneliness. And the movie still ends with the reprise of the song and the pop ballad version over the end credits, so the movie is built around this song that was cut, and the scene's way too rushed without it, but way too slow with it. When Love is Gone is a black hole of pacing from which nothing can escape. Now, as an adult, I do like the song, but A, I'm not sitting through an entire movie of Pan and Scan for it, and B, it could stand to have another minute shaved off. But I have no such misgivings about the next musical number. <laughs> it's in the singing of a street corner choir. It Feels Like Christmas is the greatest sequence in the history of Christmas movies and specials. Every piece of it is exactly right. No other filmed moment makes me feel more like Christmas than It Feels Like Christmas. 
that's the scene that makes it officially the Christmas season. The song captures the joy of the holiday, partially through the melody designed to evoke a familiar Christmas carol. It is the season of the heart, a special time of caring, the ways of love made clear. An excelsis Deo. Watching the poor, miserable folks of the town come together for joy when the only thing we had seen bring them together previously was spite is enough to warm any heart, even Scrooge's eventually. But what I love about Kane's performance here is that it does take him a moment to warm up to it. He's still taking in the information reservedly, maybe even skeptically. He sees everyone else's joy, and he's even a little moved by it, but his heart is still pretty hardened, and he doesn't feel the joy fully until the spirit personally invites him to dance along to his song. And that's where Scrooge, after being weakened by memories of the past, truly begins his transformation, where he starts to feel joy. Then he feels misery again over the next couple of scenes, but at least now he knows what joy can feel like, and he's ready to spread it around in the end with a thankful heart. With a thankful heart, with an endless joy, with a thankful heart is the second best musical number in the movie, as Scrooge is happy as a kid on Christmas receiving a gift, that gift being Christmas itself, and his youthful exuberance is such a 180 from his curmudgeonliness from the beginning of the film, but it's still entirely believable as being the same character, because Michael Caine is just that good. And yeah, maybe he's not the most experienced singer in the world, not that I'm one to judge, but his joy is just so contagious in his song. Stop and look around you. Okay, one last nitpick, the choreography and blocking here is a little awkward. Kane really feels like he's stalling between lyrics. The extra's just like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. It's fine, they had limited set space to work with. There, I hope that's enough nitpicking for you, cynical YouTube audience who only likes it when people trash beloved childhood movies. I'm going back to praise now. I love this movie, and I will continue to watch it every year, and I'm sure many of you will too. And I hope you all have a wonderful holiday season, full of whatever your favorite traditions are, and may you all go out there and find that love that feels like Christmas. And until next time, this is Dave, signing off.